Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. She is amazing. Her name is Terry. I'm, I'm I said Terry. I should slap myself. It's Tara Pyfram. <laughs> she is an author, and she's amazing. She has post-traumatic stress disorder, and she works with people to help others because she learned how to cope with herself. And now she's here helping millions of people around the world cope with post-traumatic stress disorder, a very common disorder that so many people in our society suffer from. And I'm so honored to have you on this show. And I thank you for coming on the show to share your knowledge and to share information about your book that's coming out. And I really want to learn more about you. So why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Uh, nice to meet you, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, my name's Tara Pyfram, and I was born and raised in the Bahamas. <laughs> so island girl, my whole life, uh, all of my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents were all born and raised in the Bahamas. Uh, I had a career as an um, office assistant, administrative assistant for 17 years, and uh, was living quite happily and comfortably with my wife and our young daughter and our five dogs in the Bahamas uh, up until 2019. And uh, then everything changed. Now, can you tell everybody what happened? Because your story is so amazing and it's so traumatic. Like when I, you know, when you were telling me what happened, I just, my mouth dropped and I couldn't imagine being in the situation that you were in and having to go through everything that you went through. So tell the audience a little about that day and how that one day changed your entire life. Well, when you, when you live by the ocean, when you live on an island, you come to expect hurricanes. I've dealt with hurricanes my entire life. Everyone in the Bahamas has. Uh, six months out of the year, it's hurricane season. We've battled and survived countless hurricanes. Right. And in 2019, Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas. And we were ready. We had all of our supplies. We had the house shuttered up. We were as ready as we could possibly be. We were not expecting anything out of the ordinary. Right. And then the hurricane showed up and it was 185 mile per hour wind. And at its peak, there, were, there was 30 feet of ocean storm surge that covered 50% of the island. Wow. So young child, uh, thank goodness she knew how to swim and knew how to swim really well because we were swimming inside wow. of our house for hours. Wow. No rescue available in the middle of a storm like that. No one can come out and help you until the storm is gone. You are oh, stuck wow. and you are by yourself. I can't even imagine that. That that is so traumatic, you know. And and even for your your family and your children, you know, how how did your daughter cope with that too? And 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 how did your wife cope with that? Like that's that's traumatic, you know. You know, you have no help. You're just fighting for your life is basically what you're doing, you know, and you don't know the outcome. And that has to be so scary. You know, I, I can't even fathom, you know, what was going on in your head while this was happening? You know, you didn't know what was going to happen. There was no rescue. You, you know, you, you probably a lot of people, you know, we think the worst before we think the best, you know. So you probably had all these thoughts running through your head. You know, tell us a little deeper. What, what was really going on? What, what was going on with you and then watching your, the people you love around you and your pets, especially how were you coping with this? How, what was going through your mind? We really weren't coping. <laughs> it was, it was very much a minute to minute survival. How are we going to survive this? What are we going to do if this thing happens? What are we going to do if that things happen? What if the water reaches the ceiling and we yeah. have our heads pressed against the ceiling with no breathing room? And that was the image that was kind of the one that we were trying to avoid, but at the same yeah. time had absolutely no control over. Right. Because the water, the water kept rising. So first it was ankle deep, then it was knee deep, then it was waist deep, then it was above the kitchen counters. Wow. The dogs are sitting on the counters. They're they're sitting on the floating dining room table. Our daughters huddled in a wet blanket. Uh, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And my wife and I are, you know, trying to keep her calm. And I oh, know you're a really good swimmer. You will be fine. You know how to swim. Remember, you you're you're good. You're will be fine. And 
while we're trying to convince her that we're going to we're going to be fine we're having a conversation within her earshot about can we swim to the neighbors we don't have a boat what can we use as a boat we don't have a life jacket what can we do we've got pool floats we've got cot mattresses that are floating yeah. we've got extension cords to use as rope uh, all of those kind of things going on all at the same time what are we going to do how are we going to survive how are we going to keep our heads above water right now, once you were able to get help, once the storm, you know, surpassed and help came in and you were, you and your family were able to be saved, you know, you know, when did you start to notice that you weren't feeling the same when, when you started to notice some symptoms from the post-traumatic stress disorder? And a lot of times, many people I've spoken with that have post-traumatic stress disorder don't even know that they have it. It's other people noticing the change within them. And then saying something to them, you're, you're not acting right. Why are you, you know, why are you having these outbursts? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Did you, did you feel the difference after the traumatic event entered your life? Did you start to see changes in the way you felt, the way you thought, you know, your life overall? What happened afterwards? So afterwards, we went from recovery into uh, evacuation, Mm -hmm. uh, so evacuating off of the island of South Florida from South Florida, it was what it, we've lost everything. We have no home. We're homeless. We can't imagine going back to the disaster zone. That was the island afterwards, no utilities, no running water, yeah. things, you know, trouble getting food and things like that. We can't go back. Right. What are we going to do? Yeah. We're going to, we're going to move to another country. We're not ever going to ride out another hurricane ever again. We're going to go as far away from hurricanes as we possibly can. So within six weeks of losing everything, we were in Canada. Wow. And so there was a lot going on in those first couple of weeks. And there was a lot of just keep going, just keep moving, just keep fixing, just keep problem solving. We'll get to a point of being stable at some point. Let's just, let's just get to that point of being stable. Yeah. And after about two months of, of let's just keep going. Yeah. I hit a brick wall where everything was just too overwhelming to cope with yeah trying to figure out what to have for dinner was too overwhelming to cope with uh trying to get our young daughter to go to bed on time was too much to cope with yeah and so that was really the okay i'm I, i'm not okay i need to prioritize my mental health i need to get some help because i'm i'm not coping at all and I noticed that for, for, for all human beings, I think we, we're, we're like a pot of boiling water, you know, and you can only keep that hot flame on for so long. And then mm -hmm. eventually that water is going to boil over. Mm -hmm. you know, we're human. We are not superheroes, you know, you know, a human being can only handle so much, you know, and, and I've heard people say, well, I'd never experienced that. Well, I'm sure you have, you just haven't realized it. You know, some people have outbursts, some people pick on others, some people, you know, there's so many different ways of exemplifying symptoms that you've gotten to the point where you, you just can't handle anything anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? And so when you notice that, you know, the, the simplest tasks were so difficult now, you, you were so overwhelmed with everything you went through that you just, you, you couldn't function like you normally did beforehand what was the next step? What did you do? Like, after, as soon as that happened, did you go to help get help? Or did you try your own methods and your own ways of, of trying to deal with it? Like, what was the next step for you? The next step was therapy. I, I, I knew that at that point, I had already gone a month past the point of I need someone else's help. Yeah, I can't I can't do this on my own. Right. Um, and it was it was the same with our daughter and with my wife. We we were each not coping in different ways. Yeah. yeah. And so we each needed different coping mechanisms. Yeah. And in, in the years that that followed, we were almost never on the same page at the same time. We were coexisting yep. and we were supporting one another. But the you know, the day that I felt hopeless, she felt better or the day that I felt overwhelmed, my daughter wasn't having a great day. And right. so we were never in the same place at the same time for a couple of yes. years, at least. But it, it was therapy, I needed I needed therapy. And it's it's amazing that you guys were able to survive so long underneath the same roof, because when people are like that, 
it gets very hard. The mm -hmm. communication, the relationship, everything gets affected, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's amazing that you were able to all hold on, you know, so long because a lot of people, it does, they don't hold on as long and, and they don't get to that point where you guys lasted a few years of just trying to hold on by a thread. Mm -hmm. Then you were able to reach out and get the help you needed. Now I'm a big, big advocate for therapy. I think therapy is a great um, uh, a great thing that so everybody, if they're going through things in life, it's always good to get an um, unbiased opinion and mm -hmm. to have somebody, you know, suggest different coping skills or, or have you, you know, try new things to help yourself overcome certain areas of your life that you're struggling with. Now, when you went for therapy, how did that change your life? What were some of the things you noticed after you were able to, you know, connect with somebody and work with somebody on the issues that you were having? So I, it, the therapy that I went to after um, the storm was not my first time in therapy. Mm -hmm. So I was familiar with talk therapy prior to that and found it very helpful. And I agree with you that I'm pretty sure everybody on planet earth needs therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's for a traumatic experience or something that happened in your childhood or your relationships, everyone could benefit from therapy at some oh, point. hundred uh, percent. For me, uh, it, it took a really long time for me to feel better with therapy. And there were yeah. days that I had to, oh, I really don't want to go today. Oh, I really don't want to face it today. But I know that I need to. Yes. I know that it will help. I have to give it time. I need to keep doing it. Yes. And so there was a lot of, of self-coaching and self-motivation. And my wife and I motivating each other. Oh, I don't want to go today. No, you should go today. Right. Uh, and so there was a lot of that. And it, it took a long time. Part of my initial talk therapy was um was writing therapy so my wife had been encouraging me since the storm just to write down what had happened to us because our story was so unbelievable you couldn't make it up yeah. the things that we went through to survive and the length of time that we spent thinking that we were going to die yeah. uh, so she had been encouraging me to write it down like i can't i can't i can't, I can't face it yeah. and then my therapist got wind of the fact that i have been a writer all my life, but never as a writer to give it to anyone else. Yeah. So I've written poetry most of my life, but right. usually just, just for me. Yeah. Yeah. And so when she got wind of the fact that I was a writer, oh yes. Okay. That's what we're going to do. You're going to write this down. And for months it was write a small section, chronological order, read it out yeah. loud, read it again, read it again, read it again, desensitization. Yeah. Uh, and after a few months of that, that was okay. I'm starting to feel better. I can, I can talk about this a little bit better. I can talk yeah. about it, you know, without completely losing my mind every time I try to have a conversation. Right. Wow. And so when, you know, there's so many different techniques that people use when they do writing therapy, some people will write and then they feel like when they overcame that certain situation, they'll rip it out and they'll rip it up. Some people will put it in a in an envelope and they might on a bonfire or, or a fireplace, they'll put, throw it in and it'll be like the past is gone and now I'm in the present and I'm moving towards the future, you know, or is it something that you wanted to hold on to, to remember where you came from? Like, what did you do after you wrote and after every you got everything out on paper or on the computer, however you did it? What did you do next with all those emotions? Because I'm sure as you were writing, you probably became more and more emotional because what happens when we write, it, it just, it stirs up all those repressed mm -hmm. emotions and you start feeling it and you start feeling things that you never felt before. And that could be very painful too, you know, and for therapy, it usually it's, it's a, you always get to a pain point, a maximum pain point. And then once you overcome that, then life starts to get a lot smoother. Mm -hmm. But there is a part where it gets, it's a very painful part and you have to overcome that. So when you were writing, what did you do after you were writing? Like what was going on? Were you, you know, what was going on in your head? What was, you, what were you doing with that writing? Like explain to me. It very much felt like I was taking the pain out mm -hmm. and putting it into that page. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of my writing is computer writing. I'm not a, I'm not a hand writer. I can barely read my own handwriting. <laughs> uh, um, years of working in lawyers offices will do that. <laughs> uh, so it, it very much felt like I was getting the pain out of my body physically and putting yes. it into this word document. 
Gotcha. Um, and then the rereading of it was mm -hmm. the desensitization part. Oh, I see. There was there was never a part of it that felt like, okay, when I'm done with it, I need to burn it. I need to get rid of it. I need to make the pain go away. Yeah, yeah. As we, as I got to start to feel better and got over that kind of mountain that you were, you were saying, I was able to look back and think, wow, I've got like, I've got like 10 chapters here. This is like half a, this is half a book. Yeah. Wait, I've written, I've written a book. I've always, <laughs> I've always wanted to write a book yeah. and I just wrote a book without even realizing that I wrote a book. Yeah. I have some, I have something. This is, this is it. This is, this is what I'm going to do with this. Yeah. I'm, this is how I'm going to move forward. That's amazing. That's amazing. So then you took it and you actually started to organize it and create a book. And did you put any coping mechanisms in it or were the coping mechanisms really in it? Cause you were telling your life story. Like what, what did it consist of? It was it moment to moment, what was going on and then everything that was going through your head. Like, tell me a little about your writing and we you know. Yeah. So initially it was very much a chronological first, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Very descriptive, very detailed, very emotionally raw. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I didn't hold anything back because all of this was just for therapy. Right. And I needed to get those emotions out. Definitely. Uh, so the, the first draft, so to speak, was very much diary, like journal, like, yes. mm -hmm. uh, when I got on the outside of that and thought, Oh, well, this is, wow, okay, this is, this could be a book. Yeah. Uh, then I, I kind of sat back and I, okay, how, what do I, how do I make this more than just someone reading my journal? Yeah. Where do I go with this? Right. And that actually, that time period actually came during COVID when everyone's at home, you're not allowed to leave. Mm -hmm. You need to do something with your time. Yeah. Uh, and so, that was what I did with my time. I kind of went with what I had as the the core and the middle of the book right? and kind of gave background information and explained where I was now and how I got to this point now and, and mm -hmm. how we were, my wife and I were at different points at different times and how we managed to communicate our way through it. And, you know, uh, lesser people lose marriages over trauma and PTSD. Yeah. Um, and we just, we loved, e we loved each other through it. Right. It was great that you guys could support each other. Did she also suffer post-traumatic stress disorder as well? Yes. Yeah. All three of us, um, had PTSD. Um, our daughter bounced back the quickest. Mm -hmm. Um, she was only six years old at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. It's very deep stuff to be faced with death at yeah. six. Oh yeah. Um, there I have, I still have horrible vivid memories of her screaming. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to drown. I don't want to die from my six year old. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but her therapy was play therapy, mm -hmm. which was really good for her. She was really young. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so trying to get her to talk about the emotions of, of what was going on in her head. And did she even have the vocabulary for those things at that point? Yeah. Um, so she had an amazing play therapist who would get on the floor and floor and play animals and dolls and draw pictures and have superheroes. And, and that really helped her process it all. Oh, so she perfect. was, she was really had less of an impact of it, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, than my wife and I, and for my wife and I, it was, um, it, it was different for her. It was grief and loss. Mm -hmm. um, we lost, we lost everything. She had tens of thousands of childhood photographs gone, things that her parents had left her. Yeah. They're both passed away. All of that, it, it's gone. Mm. And so there was a lot of, a lot of grief at the loss for oh. her. Mm -hmm. For me, I wasn't so much grieving the loss as I was, um, I had a lot of guilt. Yeah. Why didn't we make, why didn't we make different decisions? Why didn't we leave? Why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? Hindsight is 2020. Yeah. And so I had to come to terms with the fact that the decisions that we were making was based on all hell breaking loose and not from logical thought. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think we have logical thought when chaos is a no. We just react. Yes. You know, and it's just reacting for survival. You're doing whatever you can at the moment that you think is the best thing so you could survive what you're going through at that very moment. Mm -hmm. you know? 
I don't think that it's impossible to be logical at those times, types of crises. You know, it's just, you're just reacting, you know, you just want to survive. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, it, it's good that you learn how not to blame yourself because it yes. was your fault, you know? Mm -hmm. And so many people, I think that's what the biggest problem is. So many people, when situations occur that are traumatic in their lives, they're like, they blame themselves. Like I could have did this. I could have did that when it, 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 it was virtually impossible for them to do anything. It wasn't their fault, you know, but as humans, for whatever reason, we, so many of us do that, you know, I could have did this. I should have did this, you know, maybe if I did this, it would have been better, you know, but we, I think we have to just, you know, at, at every, every, at every moment we do the best we can. And we can't really ask ourselves a question of why we just mm -hmm. do the very best we can and give ourselves credit for, for doing that. I think now yeah. when you went through all this and now you have the post-traumatic stress disorder, how did you learn how to cope with it? Like how, on a daily basis, I'm sure there's things in life. Sometimes you get overwhelmed. You don't want to burst out in anger. Or you don't want to, you know, behave a certain way or do something, you know, or feel a certain way. So how do you, what are great coping mechanisms? And do you practice this on a daily basis? Has it become a normal part of your lifestyle? Absolutely has become a normal knee-jerk reaction to this is I, I can recognize now that I'm feeling this because of this and this is what I need to do to help myself through this right. moment in time um, some of the coping mechanisms that I've learned through therapy uh, was uh, creative visualization mm -hmm. so I'm overwhelmed in this circumstance I can't deal I can't cope I need to remove myself from the room or the thing or whatever for just a couple of minutes yes close my eyes and think about that happy place. Yeah. Uh, my happy place is the ocean. Mm -hmm. So my therapist was not particularly happy with the idea of me using the thing that tried oh. to kill me <laughs> as my happy place. But mm -hmm. believe it or not, that is my happy place. And yeah. so if I want to go to my happy place, I'm going to sit on that completely empty Bahamas beach and stare at the ocean. Yes. Because when I think of the ocean, I don't think about that storm. I don't think about about almost dying in the ocean yes i think about those beautiful calm crystal peaceful Serene. days yeah. yeah um i have issues with wind mm. so i don't i don't do well with wind especially at night um so for instance we we live in canada now we have yeah. winter now where we never had winter before yeah um and so if there is a snowstorm Mm -hmm. And it's very windy and I can hear the wind howling at night. Yeah, yeah. It will, it will keep me awake. I will get anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the, uh, one of the other coping mechanisms was the five, four, three, two, one. So uh, five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can feel, two things you can, you know, and through your senses and kind of listing those things as a way to, to combat anxiety. Right. Uh, I also do box breathing or square breathing, mm -hmm. um, which is, which I find particularly helpful. Again, nighttime anxiety. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll get sucked into my head on the, I have this massive list of things I need to do. And then the anxiety kicks up. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, five, five breaths in, hold for five, five breaths out, pause mm -hmm. for five and then repeat. Uh, and I've, I've found that really helpful as well. Breathing is such a, and you know, that people don't realize how powerful when you do breathing exercises and you slow your breathing down and you clear your mind and you're focusing on just the breathing and maybe putting something positive in your mind, it can change the whole demeanor of how mm -hmm. you're feeling at that moment and put you in a whole different, you know, area, you know, where you start to feel more relaxed, more calm, more focused, you know, I think breathing is such a, powerful tool that people need to incorporate into their lives. I think it's really great that you do that. Mm -hmm. I, I have a tendency to hold my breath when okay. I'm anxious and holding my breath then causes me to have migraines. <laughs> oh. So I have had to learn over the course of the last four and a half years, not to hold my breath and to be aware that I am holding my breath. Right, right, right. When you did that, were you even noticing that you were holding your breath or was it just so natural that you didn't even realize you were doing it? I had no idea I was doing it. My therapist had to tell me I was doing it. Wow. You need to breathe, she would say. Oh, I am breathing. No, 
you need to actually breathe. You're holding your breath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I, I hear stuff like that all the time when people have post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of times they'll do things and they don't even realize they're doing mm -hmm. it. And there's somebody else out there observing them and noticing that they're doing certain things. And, you know, and it, and it's good, I think too, that you, that you were open-minded enough to take, you know, suggestions from others, because a lot of times people, they don't like to, they don't like to maybe um, open up you know, because mm -hmm. they, they are scared of opening up and they don't like to take uh, advice from others. You know, um, a lot of people are in denial a lot of, a lot of the times, or, and they don't want to accept the situation, you know, and, and, or, and they, they don't, you know, they learn, they, they see themselves changing. They don't like who they are and they, they don't know how to love themselves anymore. And they become, you know, it, be, it becomes a, a very negative behavior where they look in the mirror and they don't even like the person they see. And then the anger and then the anxiety and then all these emotions start to come and the depression and stuff like that. So I think it's so important when you have, you know, negative emotions, denial and all these different things. And you notice that there's a change to go get help. I think mm -hmm. what you did was really an amazing um decision to go get help you realized there was a problem and your you your whole family got help which i thought is amazing that's mm -hmm. great now how is your daughter today now that she has that she got the play therapy does she continue with the play therapy or is she overcome this little hump and she's now functioning better and she doesn't she just she she goes along with her day uh she is still in therapy um okay she transitioned out of their play therapy she's older now she has the vocabulary to to have talk therapy help okay we we have always um over the last four and a half years made it a point of talking about the storm as a family like yeah. it hasn't be it hasn't become a taboo subject mm -hmm. we continue to revisit what happened and when and how we feel and how it's affecting us today and oh i don't like this because of the wind or i don't like that, be that because of what happened during dorian yeah. and and so we're very open with her about communicating and being um being open to hear her and help her process as things come up as memories come up right now what i think is amazing is that early on you mentioned that you you were amazed because you realized you wrote a book now you have a it's coming out you you've actually gotten it published and it's going to be coming out you know in in the near future so can you tell us a little about it maybe do you know the title yet or are you still deciding on the title no i do know the title um i i struggled with with how to kind of tie uh what was shaky therapy pages yeah, yeah. into a memoir and and how to tie it all together and and ultimately ultimately it turned out to be uh the ocean the ocean is the thread that ties it all together and so the book is called the ocean in our blood and yeah. it is uh is scheduled for release july 10th 2025 so next summer i love it and as it happens july 10th is actually the bahamas independence day is it really? It oh, is. I love that. I well, love that was that. that was a total omen and total kismet and and uh, not planned at all. <laughs> that is amazing. Now, will this be um, where could we find this book when it comes out? Uh, so you can go to my website. It's www.tarapyfrom.com. So T-A-R-A-P-Y-F-R-O-M. Uh, and you'll find links there for uh, signing up for pre-order information uh, you can also find me on Instagram, Tara Pyfram, or Facebook, Tara Pyfram Author. And I post regularly and I keep everyone up to date on, on what's happening. And I'm uh, expecting to hear back from the publishers any day now with uh, my next round of edits. So it's a work in progress. As we keep going, there'll be a book cover, you know, details and, and all of those things. Oh, I'm so excited for you. That is wonderful. Now, if you had to take what we talked about today, because we covered a lot of different areas on um, what happened in your this specific part of your life that kind of changed your whole world, what are some takeaways that you would like to express to the audience that you feel um, really are important, like you would like to emphasize? Ask for help. Accept help. Whenever you are offered help, accept it. We were homeless and had no idea where to go and what to do next. And someone said, here, let me help you. Yes, thank you. 
here, here's, a, here's some some old T-shirts. Here you go. You need these. Yes, thank you. We can get you off the island. Yes, thank you. Right. Always, always take help. I can't do this by myself. I need help figuring out how to cope. Find a therapist. Yes. If the first therapist you go to doesn't feel like the right fit, because that person probably isn't the right fit. The right. One therapist isn't for everybody. If you're not connecting with your therapist, find a different one. Right. If the behavioral therapy that you're trying isn't working, try a different one. Right. It's not a one size fits all. And it's not a, this is going to work 100% of the time. Right. The techniques that I mentioned don't work for me 100% of the time. Sometimes this thing will work. Sometimes that thing will work. Sometimes I run through all of them and it don't work at all. And I just have to wait until it passes and the next day is a better day. Right. The other thing that was, that was super important for me was the positivity of having forward motion. So having something in the future to look forward to, having something to work towards, yes. uh, looking at that light at the end of the tunnel, like knowing that it's there, knowing you can get to it. It's just a matter of time. Right. I think that's so important. I think those are great takeaways. I, I think, you know, people have to really understand too. They have to let go of their ego sometimes too. Like people don't always like to accept help from others and they have to realize, you know, in time of need, you know, accept, you know, get, get rid of that pride that you, you carried all these years and accept, accept help because people wouldn't offer it if they didn't want to, if they didn't care, they wouldn't offer themselves or whatever they are offering to you if they didn't care. So, mm -hmm. you know, take it with a grain of salt and gratitude and be happy and, 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 and that you have somebody that either opened their house to you or gave you a t-shirt or, you know, helped you mm -hmm. in some way or helped you get to a different location where you could start a new life. So I, I think that that is really good, great advice. I'm really, really, you know, I think your whole story is amazing. And I think, I think you're amazing. And I think how your whole entire family overcame this is just, it, it is, it's, it's truly amazing because you had three positive outcomes and you don't usually see that, you know, you mm -hmm. have three people who went through a traumatic event together and all three of you came down with post-traumatic stress disorder and all three of you were able to overcome and get help and move on with your life. And that itself is a miracle in itself. And, you know, I think the way you went about getting the help and how you, you did it and how you were able to communicate with your family is very important too. Mm -hmm. I always say to people, communication is key. You have to keep the conversation open. You have to communicate with the people you love with because it's important that you, you understand what they're going through because you know, what we think that we're going through and what somebody else is going through, you know, everybody's different. Everybody handles things different. So communication is really important, like you mentioned. So mm -hmm. I give you kudos for everything you've done. And I thank you so much for being on the show. I hope you'll come back one day and we could talk more about this because I think people need to hear more about what you've gone through and, and more different ways to help themselves, you know, because you have so many people in this world with post-traumatic stress disorder. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I My only hope is that someone listening that's going through their tough time yeah. can really hear that recovery is attainable. It will get better. Yes. Yes. I love that. Positivity is key. It, it truly is. is. It truly is. Thank you so much, Tara, for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.